Welcome to this week's episode of The Juice Cast. Today, we'll be hosting a roundtable discussion featuring Kenny and Rachel from Studio Dow, Pablo from Moon Dow, and filmmakers Susie and Fernando. In this conversation, we'll discuss the upcoming Ticket to Space documentary, which tells the story of Yan, a member of Mundao from Beijing, who will be sent to space on a Blue Origin rocket in Texas sometime in the next few months. We discuss how the documentary got started, what it means for a Chinese citizen to go to space on American soil, and the meta-narrative of how the first feature-length film about a Dao is being crowdfunded by another Dao. We hope you enjoy the first part of this series of conversations that will follow this experimental collaboration between Moon Dao and Studio Dao. All right, welcome Pablo, Susie, and Fernando, and all of you. It's really great to have everyone here today. How is everyone doing? Hi, thank you for having us. Very good, very good. And we also have uh, Kenny and Raquel here from Studio Dow, so it's it's a full house. This is by far the uh, the largest <laughs> Juiced Cast uh, <laughs> assembled guest panel that we've ever had. So maybe maybe we can start with maybe we can start with Pablo, since Pablo is uh, you know a two time Juiced Cast alumni. Uh, <laughs> has appeared on our Moon Dow episode and also the Constitution Dow retrospective. Um, but for listeners who might not be familiar, uh, maybe you could give us an introduction to yourself uh, before we dive into the filmmaking side of things. Totally. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a veteran at this point. Um, yeah, so I'm the, the founder of Moon Dow and super excited to be joined here by Fernando, Susie, Kenny, Raquel. Um, yeah, I feel like this is a, a dream team of, uh, of producers and studio DAO artists. And uh, yeah, uh, this, is, this is cool. Um, yeah, Moon DAO was started about a year ago. And uh, it's crazy that we're, we're at this point now where we're like filming a, a documentary and, and all of that. It's, it's really exciting. So, yeah. Could you give us just like a super quick high level overview of what Moondao is? Totally. Um, so Moondao was started at the end of 2021. Um, and our, our initial goal was to send uh, one of our members up into space. And um, we, we ended up raising uh, enough to buy two tickets with Blue Origin. And um, we sent one one person up uh, in August of 2022, and that person was uh, Kobe Cotton from from Dude Perfect. Uh, we did a, a DAO vote, and uh, they were the winners. And um, we're sending another member up in in a few months, and his name is Yan Kajun. He's from China. He's a father of three, and uh, it'll be the first time that uh, a Chinese uh, citizen is going to space from U.S. soil. Um, so really, really excited about that. And um, yeah, we, we uh, tapped uh, Fernando and Susie to, to help document um, his, his voyage uh, from China to the US and then up into space. And it's a big moment for Moondao and, and for, for space generally. Um, you know, space has been one of these things that, um, at least in the Cold War, it was a way uh, that, you know, Russia and the United States could kind of work together and collaborate on on shared shared things. Um, there was a competitive element to it too, but then you have you know the ISS and you have Russian cosmonauts working with uh, U.S. astronauts, and yeah, I think it's uh, it's one of those things that a lot of people can can get behind. So definitely, yeah, that's a great overview. And speaking of Susie and Fernando, could you guys also give a bit of a background about yourself and maybe some of the films that you've worked on in the past? Uh, would you like to start things off, Susie? So I'm a San Francisco-based producer, director, EP. Um, a lot of my background is in travel and advertising space, um, documentary branded content, uh, especially the last decade or so. So a lot of the stories I've focused on have been in technology and some regenerative agriculture. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got a little cold as of last night. Um, food systems, uh, global culture and art culture, and some stories about immigrants and refugees. Uh, my longest running in-house gig recently was in travel, working for TripAdvisor, building out 
uh, from the ground up their in-house uh, video studio and creative studio. So we would service advertising clients and uh, put together a lot of unscripted stories and series and um, served all the media groups under that umbrella. So it was a bunch of different travel brands. And um, that led me to do a lot of international filmmaking, a lot of international work. So many, many thousands of international projects, which is kind of how this group has all gotten together as we've, we're uh, reaching out all over the world for this particular project, which is really exciting. Amazing. And Fernando, could you also give us a brief introduction? Yes. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, I am Fernando. I am based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I am a film director, also a cinematographer. I have been specializing in documentaries mainly for the past 10 years, I would say. I also uh, shoot commercials, but documentary is by far the thing that I feel most passionate about. Um, I recently had my second movie come, in, uh, come out in 2022. It's a documentary called Hostile. Um, it's about a, a voyage that a, a group of expeditionaries made to Patagonia, to southern Patagonia, uh, with the help of uh, the Google Tracker, the 360 camera provided by Google. Um, this, the same camera used for Google Maps, but in this case, it's a, it's a version of it that allows you to take it to very remote places in the world. So basically, the movie is about... Um, this trip that these guys uh, make into several glaciers in Patagonia. And with the help of this camera, they, um, they try to raise awareness of how climate change is impacting these regions and how these glaciers are uh, having a dramatic um, heat and a dramatic change because of how uh, the sun and, and our Earth is um, temperature is rising every year. Um, so yes, basically I have been working in documentaries that are aimed at social change and how people are across different uh, sectors and different uh, social classes can collaborate together to create uh, and to produce social change and social impact. Um, my other documentary, uh, which I directed and wrote with a colleague of mine called Ignacio, uh, it's also about uh, how a group of people um, got together to fight over a piece of rainforest in northern Argentina and how they uh, managed to create a national park out of it and the fight that they are still doing to reintroduce uh, different animal species that have been wiped out from those regions, uh, specifically the, the jaguar which is uh, the national animal of Argentina. So, yeah, for the, for the last 10 years, as I said, I have been working in different projects with different uh, colleagues of mine here in Argentina and also around the world. And so, yeah, for us, uh, being able to work with Pablo and especially in this uh, story, which is so, um, so actual, uh, it's, it's really a, a great opportunity for us. We're really excited to to meet Jan in person, to to travel to the States and to see this magnific magnificent rocket uh, soar up to the sky. Before we jump into the documentary, I just wanted to give Kenny and Raquel a chance to talk a little bit about your backgrounds, where you, you all are coming from, and then also introduce us again, kind of high level, to what Studio Dow is and how it fits into this picture. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, hi, I'm, I'm Kenny, and uh, I'm one of the founders of Studio DAO. Uh, studio DAO is an experimental studio where we're working on new models for crowdfunding, new models for network creation, and we're really inspired by uh, a lot of the architectures that we've seen grow successfully in the space over the last year and a half, both with like Juicebox and the success that Pablo's had um, organizing thousands of people around the world on this one mission. So we're, we're not gonna dive too deep into what Studio DAO is, but uh, 
our role on this project is to enable Tickets to Space to get made, to create a new kind of collective action where people who participate in the funding of the film really can be a part of a tangible community. And so this this podcast is really the, the kickoff event to communicate to the world about what we're doing led by the funding of Ticket to Space, but then secondarily the formation of new kinds of communities. And that's that's the effort that we're playing a role in. And I'll, I'll let Rachel introduce herself. Mm-hmm. Um, hi, I'm I'm Rachel, also known as Raquel. Raquel is my NFT artist name, actually. Um, and I've got a long background in producing interactive design, media, video games, apps, and have been so enthralled to sort of be a part of um, creating just the blueprint for our MVP and the sort of the vision of how people will be able to um, interact with these films in this way and be a part of it. It's really been exciting and I can't wait to see where we all take it together, so. That's great. Yeah, there's definitely a lot going on here and we've obviously explored Moon Dow and Studio Dow in the Juice Cast in past episodes. In fact, when we were recording the Moon Dow episode, it was right around the time right before Kobe Cotton was sent to space by the Dow. So I'm wondering if you can maybe tell us about how the Ticket to Space documentary first got started and how you all got involved through that. Well, it all started when um, Pablo and I met in in Bogota, in Colombia. And I was shooting uh, a different project, also for a different Dow, a project that uh, Susie and I were working together. And at that time, the DevCon was happening in, in Colombia, so that's why Pablo and other prominent DAO uh, people were there. And um, we were staying in the same house, and I remember one night, Pablo and I, uh, we started talking about uh, the s- space and the stars. You could see a beautiful st- uh, starry night. And Pablo happened to mention just like something completely ordinary, yeah, because I'm part of this DAO that uh, we're trying to make uh, access to space more democratic. And I was like, okay, uh, what does that mean? Well, we are um, <clears throat> basically, uh, we're going to send one of our members to space. And I was actually quite impressed by that. And I was like, like to actual space on a rocket ship. Yes. And he handed me one of the actual ticket to space um, engraved in a, like in a metal, in a metal, it's, it's a ticket and like, it looks like a, like a cinema ticket, but with a serial number and uh, the name of the DAO and basically the, all the images that um, make up the brand of Mundao. And, and, that, and at that point it hit me that, you know, these guys, at, as crazy as they seemed, they were, they were real, you know, they were... <laughs> They were actually sending people into space. So after a few days um, of talking, you know, uh, coming and going, and Pablo and his brother were, were um, you know, we were talking about maybe the possibility of going to China to meet Jan in person, to maybe start filming uh, part of the story. Um, but we quickly realized that this story was way bigger than just Jan just uh, his trip of, you know, going to the U.S. and getting into uh, the rocket ship, but it was also the story of how, you know, 11,000 people around the world got together to create this DAO and to, you know, pursue this magnificent objective of sending, you know, people into space, something that now is really, uh, is really private, is really reserved for multimillionaires, And the fact that Mundao is uh, sending a regular guy like myself uh, to space is something that quickly grabbed our attention. So I I made a quick phone phone call to Susie and I said, Susie, I think we have something big in our hands. Uh, I'm going to need you on board, please. This is uh, this will be an international story. We're going to need as many people as we can, um, as many talents uh, as we know around the globe to to help us. So I, I don't know if uh, Pablo, you have 
the same uh, recollection of the events, but at, at, at least this is how I uh, remember it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, I just remember like coming up to you one day because I, I, Fernando was filming uh, like a bunch of different uh, events that were going on, um, and uh, I was like, "Hey, Fernando, would you be interested in uh, filming? You know, going to China with me and like, you know, finding this guy that we selected to go into space, like, like." documenting like what his life is like and you know the whole psychological journey and we just started kind of spitballing and it felt like um one of those moments it's like uh, just like it was, it was so perfect like very serendipitous that i just had happened to meet fernando right then and there um so yeah it was uh and and i feel like we just started uh like spitballing different ideas and it was like okay we, we really need to make this happen that this is and then uh Django was there too at the time and he was like I need to introduce you guys to studio now uh because they're they're making you know like films happen in a decentralized way and we're like okay well <laughs> we, we need to get everyone in a room together and make this happen okay so there's a lot to unpack here and we're going to get into all the different layers but just to start the film is kind of loosely centered around yan who's a chinese member of mundao who's the winner of the ticket to space nft and will be sent to space on a blue origin suborbital flight and then there's also pablo who is to some extent like a representative of the dao or he like a spokesperson for the dao because obviously the dao has a lot of you know, a lot of members worldwide, but there needs to be, you know, kind of someone to speak for them. So I'm wondering, I'm not sure who wants to answer, but I'm wondering how you see this film fitting in with Moondao's broader mission of decentralizing access to space research and exploration. Like broadly, what are the goals for this documentary? Like why do you feel like this story needs to be told in this way? Yeah, I think that there's there's a few reasons. Um, Firstly, it's hard to communicate what a DAO is in like just small snippets. So a long form narrative, I think, uh, would really be able to highlight and, and showcase like what what is actually happening. Just saying like, hey, we're, we're decentralizing or democratizing access to space. It's like very vague and it's hard to communicate to like what what it's like to have, you know, 11,000 like token holders all like discussing ideas in like a discord and like what is the actual like physical embodiment of this thing and like what what are the like what are the backgrounds of the people involved and why why is this happening <laughs> you know there, there's just like a lot of a lot of depth to moon dao that i think is difficult to communicate and um you know that's why that's why we have Fernando and Susie uh, helping us. Um, but yeah, I sometimes I feel like are we are we like smelling our own farts a little bit, like recording a documentary about how cool we are? Um, and I, I really hope it doesn't come across like that. Um, it's I think just like an important time right now in in the story of humanity where we're like opening up the the high frontier like we're going up into space and there's a story of like okay who gets to go is it just the rich is it um you know who who, who is space for why should we go to space who is it benefiting and what you know and then at the same time you have the the dao revolution and what what is a dao why is it important what's going on there so i think there's just a lot to tell and it's hard to condense that down into like just an article or or whatever um so i think that um yeah it, a long form documentary makes sense yeah totally yeah there's a lot of political and social layers to this documentary. I mean, Yan, a Chinese man, is being sent on an American private space flight from Beijing because a global collective called Moon Dao raised over $8 million using a borderless cryptocurrency called Ether. I mean, it all almost sounds like science fiction. Like, there's a lot to unpack here from the looming China US tensions to the private versus public space exploration to the way that DAOs are enabling borderless collaboration and coordination. And I'm wondering if 
maybe we could talk about how some of these layers are going to be explored in the documentary. Um, would you like to go ahead and start things off, Susie? Yeah, sure. I was going to piggyback on what you were saying, Pablo, that there is this, we're at, I think to use your words, we're at this inflection point in like a historical context and in a cultural context. And it's a very interesting one. There's the billionaire space race going on, um, which has turned into now a more national space race on top of that. Um, and then there's this e extreme enthusiasm for technology, but there's also a lot of fear of it right now as well. Things are moving faster than we can understand. And what it's just, a, it's, a, it's clearly a moment in time. And so I think <laughs> on the smelling your fart, our own farts comment too, I mean, Pablo and all of Mundao have been entirely on board with our vision, Fernando and my vision, to not make this a brand film. This is not a, this is not a, um, a propaganda film. This doesn't have an agenda. They're allowing us true independence and allowing them to take, to see into their world and, you know, become part of them for a time to understand it and to try to tell a true and accurate story about what's going on in this moment. And I think so in terms of our objectives for the film too, we don't have a clear ending in mind because we want to see how everything pans out. What we know is that Jan is going to have an incredible experience. Everything we've seen and watched so far about folks who have had this kind of opportunity, which is usually just for very, very wealthy people, have had completely transformative feelings at the end of it. And so something is going to happen to Jan. And we don't know what it will be. And we also don't know what's going to happen to the evolution of the Tao during this whole time period that we film. And so the, the ending is, uh, it can be completely honest and open-ended. However, it's going to, you know, maybe there's, maybe things crumble before our eyes or maybe incredible strides are made. I, 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 we imagine there'll be a lot of question marks at the end, which, which will be very interesting, just as interesting to us, that there'll be this idea that of what's possible, what's been done so far, and I think a lot has already been done so far through collective action. Um, and there's a lot of themes of collective action through uh, Fernando's past work too, which is, he's a, he's a great mind for this sort of, sort of story. Um, some, there's many stories that could unfold here that are exciting. And it's also a, a, a film that will have a lot of contrasts, big contrasts, like just imagine for a second, Jan, in the city, in the streets of Beijing. We're talking about a guy that has never been out of his city. He has never been on a plane. And he stumbled across uh, Mundao just by chance. And then on the other side, we have Pablo and some of the other Mundao engineers who are right in the frontier of technology. And, and in Silicon Valley, they are pushing forward these uh, new ways of organizing. And just to have these two universes uh, coming together in the, in the middle of the film, I think that it, it's, it's, really, it's really a huge opportunity for us uh, to be able to, to be so close to such a, such a story that I think that it can never be boring because there will always be something new happening. We will be following Jan in his uh, house with his family. I don't know if... Uh, you are aware, but of course, when he won this ticket at, at the first moment, uh, he couldn't believe it. He, I mean, imagine winning a ticket to space. I would have thought that it was uh, I was being scammed or something. You know, it's like when you got those emails back in the day saying Bill Gates is giving away money. It's like, <laughs> of course, it's it's a scam. And then uh, imagine the conflicts that already started right at the beginning of the film when his family is like, no, dad, you're not going. Are you crazy? You, you want to die? So just in the beginning of the film, you have these conflicts. Then we already know that um, because of the political tensions that we can observe now between the U.S. and China, uh, things are not uh, particularly easy for him to go to the U.S. Uh, when it comes to, you know, the administrative part, you know, the visas, the permits, so there, there we also have a, a second conflict. And, and finally, when he arrives to, to, the, to the U.S. and he is in Texas, in this massive uh, desert where he will be 
probably alone for the first time in his life. I mean, just imagine the population density in Beijing. I think he was probably never alone in his life. And now he will be there what, uh, watching this rocket go up. And I think that it will be really a, a roller coaster of uh, emotions for himself, for all the uh, Mundao community, and for us, of course. Yes. There's so much going on here. I love it. Uh, I, I mean, I'm curious to know a little bit more about like the, the risks of Yan not getting this visa approved. I mean, p- partly there's the there's not only you know the tensions between China and the U.S., but then there's also just the nature of space travel being very delicate in the sense that it's typically a government, uh, you know, that has a monopoly over space exploration, and this is now being brought into the you know into private companies which is just a totally different uh paradigm for for space travel and then i I guess the other thing that i think about in in terms of like the risks of the documentary is that uh at at least in various points in the last what five ten years china has banned cryptocurrencies Uh, i mean almost to the point that that's become a meme like there would be like oh china banned bitcoin again and and then you know the the markets would tank for a day and we'd all be sad and then the next day it'd be fine um but you know this is a you know a legal at least, I don't know if that's the case right now, but at certain points in history, it's certainly been banned in China, and I believe it still is. Like, I wonder for for Yan personally, is this a risk for him to be in the documentary and, you know, on, on camera talking about having purchased NFTs and obviously being involved, at least in the Ethereum ecosystem? Um, I, I'm just wondering if you could talk more about some of these risks, like with the, the visa that we talked about, but also, um, you know, in terms of the crypto context in, in China. China, um, there's just like so many layers to this story that are both risks, but also I think part of what makes it so rich as, as a story. Yeah, yeah, we we've been working hard to get a visa for Yen, um, and it's it's not easy. Um, we've we're now on our on our final try. So if we if we don't get it this time. Uh, he's he's barred from entering the U.S. for at least five years, five five to ten years. So we're like really trying to convince the the U.S. government basically um, that uh, this is important and that um, you know Yan coming to the United States and going on a on a rocket is uh, is like a you know something <laughs> like he he should be able to come to the United States for this. But yeah. Space is kind of a, a touchy subject, um, so yeah, we're still we're still working to get there. Yeah, and in terms of like uh, Ethereum being legal in China, I think that they're 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 allowed to use it, but uh, when it comes to exchanging uh, crypto for um, you know Chinese currency, I think that part is not allowed. So. Um, I think him participating, especially it was a, it was a free NFT um, that, that he got, that part's, from, from my understanding, is okay. Um, but yeah, there's, there's also that kind of broader like nations versus crypto narrative to this too, which is really interesting. Definitely. Um, going back to... Fernando and Susie, I'm wondering, like, what do you think are some of the challenges that you guys face with working on this film? Or what are aspects that you're most excited about when it comes to working on this documentary? Well, I think that the first, um, the first challenge would be, would be to work in a, in a different culture. Uh, you know, there's always um, some, some time, some adjusting time that you need to to take to understand how um, you know people from other cultures uh, uh, conduct themselves. So of course we will have to um, work with translators, with people that help us understand how to uh, carry all ourselves in, in Beijing. And when he comes to the U.S., um, I think that he will probably be um, very impressed by everything that is uh, going to happen to him. And one thing that I that I find very uh, curious is that when we interviewed him uh, not not long ago, he seemed to be more um, excited about going to the U.S. than about going to to space. Uh, I think he doesn't really uh, 
grasps the the idea of what he's uh, about to embark in. So uh, I think this will be a challenge working with someone from such a different culture, from the, the Eastern Hemisphere, basically. And um, also, um, you know, shooting with so um, mm. such a big time difference, you know, different time zones in China, in, in, in California, in, in, the, in the East Coast. So this will be all challenges that, of course, we have uh, dealt with in the past. Um, it's, it's basically the, the, the fuel that have a, has us running. You know, we, we live for this. We live to tell this sort of stories, uh, to go to the other side of the world and, and meet these incredible people and, and try to uh, connect people from across the world and, and, and put a, our little uh, grain of uh, salt in, in, in the idea that um, even though we seem to be, uh, people seem to be very disconnected, we, we try to make an effort to, to make people come closer through these stories. I'll add a few more challenges to the, uh, I mean, definitely the culture differences and making sure that we tell a story both for an American audience and a Chinese audience um, is, I think we can make, an, we can feature a Chinese person in to in an American audience film, but it, I, I do think it's like another um, approach to make it interesting to the Chinese audience at the same time, um, coming from us being in the West and having that as our challenge. Um, and then, yeah, the visa as well. And then I would say the very welcome and highly stimulating challenge is operating through the Dow models from the ground up for this film. Um, it's been super interesting. It's very, we try to work in public. We try to do a lot of things that just aren't conventional. Um, and so we're also sort of like forming the foundations of Studio Together, Studio Dow together as we partner with Studio Dow. And Moon Dow is very well established. And so we also are like learning the ways of Moon Dow and operating within their. Um, expectations and culture that they've created. Uh, so it's like, there's so much community support, which has made it unusually uh, helpful for our process. And yet at the same time, there's these like completely unique challenges with the specifics of the communities. Um, so I, you know, that, that story is still in progress too, the, the behind the scenes. Yeah, it's funny. I was just about to ask you about uh, Susie and Fernando, like whether you had uh, any experience working with DAOs or just decentralized communities in general. Um, I guess one of the things that Bradley and I have talked about is how it's it would actually be it is very hard to make a movie about crypto, like about almost anything related to crypto, because it's just like a bunch of people all around the world in front of computers, you know, like there, there's something about this that makes for a really bad movie. Um, you know, like the Netflix special, not immediately obvious to me, like visually. Um, but I think that's part of what's amazing about Ticket to Space is that this is such a, a human story. Like it's, it's a narrative that is, I mean, it's not just about Yan, but it's centered around Yan and that kind of anchors the story. Um, but it also relates to these broader ideas of cryptocurrencies and DAOs and decentralization and working across borders and all these different things and you know there's so much in there that's that's interesting um so yeah i'd love, love to hear about how you've been able to approach producing the film like through the lens of working within moon dao and learning how you know these organizations are, are working and how that might like inform the actual output of the film and how you approach it I think, yeah, the, the whole anonymous, the fact that characters are anonymous for some characters in the story are going to be anonymous. So we are, have visual ideas about how to portray that. Um, and, but then many are going to show their face and show up as real people in the film that are, um, that I think is a creative tactic that we're working on and are excited by and feel like we have solutions for. Um, the, story it, just as you said the story itself is so human and so you know like human life being multi-planetary is just like universally inspiring I think as a as a thread line as a story I you know there's entire 
category of sci-fi that draws in many people internationally. Um, and dreaming of being an astronaut is also a very common dream for all humans. So it's that part is so clear and so universal. And we, in our proposal initially to Moondao, we a lot of the Moondao community was also concerned, like, I don't know, they don't want this to be like a, a crypto explainer or like a heavily technical, you know, in the weeds film. And neither do we. So we're completely aligned on that, that we, we want this to be about the humans. But what's nice is we get immersed in this totally original, one of a kind universe and culture, which all great documentaries, I think, pull you in in that way. Like, if you didn't know about the spelling bee culture, you get like brought into this world um, through these stories that through these people that are featured in those documentaries. So I th we see it as that kind of way where you'll get to learn a little bit about this world, this subculture that's going on under the surface while we tell the, the main story. And also, I would add that um, even though Mundao is a, a, a virtual community, um, we have seen that some of the members and have already started gathering uh, physically, like when, when, when Jan won the ticket, some of the Moondao members of, from China organized a dinner and they went over to where he lives and they met him in person. So what we're seeing is that there's a, a, a whole new level to the human interaction that transcends Discord and transcends like the, the the Web3 space, and I think that this is really interesting. I, I'm really looking forward to, to the moment where Pablo and Jan will meet each other in person for the first time. I think that it, it will crystallize how, uh, in reality, this organization, these DAOs, are just a, a mechanism for something that is uh, way more interesting and deeper, that is... Uh, the building of relationships across different nations with someone that you might feel that is completely different to you, but yet uh, you are aligned on the pursuit of a particular goal. In this case, you know, going to space and all the all the values that Mundao has. But it will be it will be definitely a challenge to try to um, unpack what a DAO is, what Mundao is, how they interact between each other. But as Susie said, the idea is not to um, produce an explainer on Web3 and DAOs, but just to give it enough context to, to let the audience understand that what is happening in this story is even more incredible because it's, it's not a centralized agency. It's not NASA who is doing it. It's 11,000 members across the globe, from Argentina to China, from Japan to the US. So this at least from our point of view, makes it even more of a, of an, of a challenge and of, a, of an accomplishment, really, the, the fact that these guys got together and, and pulled this off. Absolutely. It's a huge challenge of coordination. Will Ticket to Space be like the first feature-length documentary about a DAO? I'd love to get some thoughts from like Pablo and Kenny and Raquel. Like, what do you think is the significance of producing a film about Moon DAO that is crowdfunded via Studio DAO using Juicebox infrastructure built and maintained by Juicebox DAO? There's like this is very much a decentralized project from the start to the finish, both in terms of the story and the way that it's being funded. You just hit on what's my favorite part about the movie is the meta story and you guys know since we've been around Juicebox while we've been building Studio DAO that it takes a long time to figure out exactly what the legal model is that can work with the filmmakers that to find filmmakers who are willing to experiment and do this transparently in public and with the collaboration of DAOs and have the patience to understand that DAOs are still finding their way. And, you know, to walk through that with us um, has meant everything to us in terms of this being the first film to really start funding on, on Studio DAO. And so for us, the entire meta story, the film fits so well because really it's, it's the story of what all of us, I think, are trying to do is to build these collaborative collectives 
and to figure out how they work, how they're supposed to work, and to kind of hold hands and work that out together um, in a direct and transparent way has been a beautiful experience. And so um, I'm very excited about the meta here. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, certainly working with uh, Susie and Fernando on this in terms of both how do we serve Ticket to Space, but how do we build a model that other filmmakers would want to use, right? I think part of the DAO ethos is we don't want this to be a zero-sum game. We want to, we want to play positive-sum games, and that means it's not about negotiating the most extractive value that you can take at the moment is about building the best community-minded system. And filmmakers are, are community-minded. It's like you make a film because you want to communicate with a community and you want, or you want to reflect what's going on in a certain community. So there's a lot of harmonics in this that are that are great for for powering it and for helping it find its footing. So I think that's that's definitely been a huge plus for I think for all of us to find that because we also we we need to find people who want to back the film. And so some of those people will come from Moondow, some of those people will come from Juicebox, some of those people will come from the space community that we reach out to in partnership with Moondow over the next few months as Moondow grows and there's more assets coming back. So I think this is a really interesting project because we will also be creating some assets along the way, including this podcast, that aren't documentation of the process. It is all part of the process. And so um, it, I think it is, there, there's no behind the scenes anymore. It's all, we're, we're all out there. And I think we're just connecting uh connecting the dots between all those things so it's um you know it's a it's a great experiment but we'll we're gonna we're gonna find a way and the all of this in the backdrop of the old guard in media burning themselves down and not knowing what to do right like there's a everyone chased netflix right over the cliff and now it's chaos. And so I think it's time for the people to come back and say, well, this is what we really want to make. And so we'll just pay for it ourselves. We don't, we don't need Wall Street to loan money to big media companies to then try to extract revenue in order to pay back those loans, which is what the way it works right now. Feels like this documentary is a radical proposition on pretty much every layer. Like, I wanted to say something else yeah, about the, the film, though, just in terms of uh, this, is, this, is, this is something that Fernando brought to the table a couple of weeks ago in terms of citizens in space, people going to space. The, the first Moondow member to go to space is a pioneer. There haven't been that many normal people. It's rich people. It's trained astronauts. So we're going to find out more as this proceeds. How does the overview affect, how does it affect regular people when they go to space, right? We know what happens when you send a pilot or, you know, or, or people have a certain perspective. But if you come from a more normal environment, I, I think that's, that's a little bit of uncharted territory. But looking into the future, when this movie comes to market and goes out for distribution, that might be a year from now, it might be more. Um, Five years from now, there will have been hundreds of normal people that have gone to space. So part of this is not just framing like, wow, this is, this is amazing because it's unique. It's unique because of where we are in time. Like this is, we're, we're experiencing something as one of the first times that it's happening and it's going to become normal. So documenting that with, and this was, this was Fernando's insight, which was just like, we can't portray it as look how amazing this is. It's more like, look how amazing this is for the first time it's happened and what does this mean for what comes next so that it's relevant and that we're self-aware so that we're not um, totally smelling our own farts. But, which, which, by the way, I wouldn't underestimate smelling our own farts. But it's, you know, that's a, that, I, I, I think there, there's something about knowing yourself and knowing like where 
um, where is this going to get put in history as technology and culture continues down this path? And also, um, I, w- I would like to add one thing to what Ken is uh, saying. I think that we need to think this in terms of, um, like when, when Neil Armstrong went to the moon or when the, uh, the, the other astronauts went to space, they had a sense of duty, right? They were doing it because they were military people or maybe scientists, you know, their life was aimed at this. And yet Jan is just a, you know, a John Doe, a Chinese John Doe. He never asked for this. And yet he won this ticket, this Willy Wonka ticket. And now he's faced with this decision. Should I go? Should I not go? This is something that we have been reflecting ourselves. Like, what, what would you guys do? Would you go if you ever won this ticket? I think it's something that really uh, makes you uh, stop everything that you're doing and really, you know, really go over this idea. Would I go? Even when you have all the risks, uh, implied in, in you know getting into a rocket so as we've been saying it's a, it's going to be a story with so many different levels and um, not only the political you know the, the rivalry between the US and China not only his personal story but I think that is a universal story about how uh, your life can be in, in, in one way and one Tuesday changes for the rest of your life you go into a Discord channel, you mint a free NFT, and suddenly you're going to China. We, we, uh, sorry, to space. We don't even know what's going to happen once he goes back to China. He might turn into a national celebrity. He might be like uh, this wonderful documentary, um, Searching for the Sugar Man, a guy that is extremely famous somewhere, but in his hometown, no one knows about him. So I think that we are getting ourselves into a, a really really nice story that might have the potential of becoming uh, something that will transcend this particular episode. And even if in five years we are going to space and everyone is going to space, there will be no uh, second chance like this one, because this is the first time we have someone going to space uh, through a DAO, through the collective action of 11,000 people across the world deciding what to do with their money. So it's, it's pretty big. Pablo, is there anything that you wanted to add to this? Yeah, this documentary is an opportunity to um, like showcase DAOs, but also to also cast light on the, the negative aspects of them too. You know, like um, we keep saying smelling your own farts, <laughs> but actually, right, like um, there are a lot of things that are still being worked out with DAOs and a lot, a lot of things too about the space industry that, that isn't perfect. And, um, you know, I think that like, uh, you know, but this isn't a, a brand movie, you know, like we're, we're giving Fernando and, and Susie access to Moon Dao to, to, you know, give their perspective from their point of view. And, um, yeah, I think that, there, there are a lot of things, you know, a, a DAO is, is kind of like a verb, you know, it's, it's not a noun, it's an active process, and we're still figuring out how to make that process work. And so, yeah, there's like aspects of, of MoonDAO that I think, I think should be highlighted, and like we're still figuring out, okay, uh, like is a DAO a speculative token? You know, I feel like that's kind of like a lens from which a lot of people view crypto, and even some 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 of our members at MoonDAO are are in it because they they think that hey maybe this thing will will pump or something like that. Um, but that stands like like the DAO isn't a monolith either, right? There there are a bunch of different people that are in there for different reasons, different motivations, and I think that there's like a really rich um, like uh like contrast between them and, and like struggle between each of the sort of motivations of, of the DAO. And um yeah, I'm I'm excited to see that like narrative play out. Because like what Fernando was saying, like this this is an active well and Kenny was saying this too, that this is happening in real time. We don't know what the ending of the of the movie is going to be. We don't know what what's gonna happen between this moment now and uh, you know, Yan going up into space. We don't even know if he'll he'll actually get his visa too. Like, there there's so many question marks here, 
Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see how that all you know, plays out. Pablo, I, I was almost wondering to what extent you felt, I don't want to use the word uncomfortable, but you're, you're kind of like the face of Moondao for this film to some extent, like you're representing the Dao, but the Dao is such a distributed community. Like there's just so many members in Moondao. And I wonder if ever you, you felt like a tension with being sort of like the, the face of, of this community or like what sort of you know, uh, compromises are being made to have you speak on their behalf. I don't know if, if, if that's a question that, that you've thought about, but it's just something that I've, I've been thinking about a little bit. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's, it's on my mind a lot too. I think like the, the role that, that I want to play is uh, trying to, you know, shift into the background as much as possible. Like um, at, at the moment, I feel like I can't just be a background character in in the DAO because it's it's still like it's still taking shape and there's still like voids in terms of our like uh, governance structure and, and things that are still you know coming together um, and yeah I I like personally I I, I do feel a little weird like being um, like in this role. Uh, of like DAO founder, like DAOs shouldn't have a, a CEO or, or central figure or any of that. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be self-aware too about, and uh, you know, what, what are my own motivations for being, you know, in, in the DAO and, and my own motivations for for being part of this, this film? Like, do, do I like the attention? <laughs> um, I, I think generally I, I I, I'm not the type of person that likes to be in the the center of attention or anything like that. Um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see how. Like I, I really want this to be more about the human story of like Yan and to cast a bunch of the other characters. But I also have to realize that I, I also am one of the characters in the film too, and that's that's a little weird to me. But like you know, I think it's just the the role that I need to play. So yeah. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, Susie, Fernando, do we have any, anything that we didn't cover? Any kind of closing thoughts, big picture thoughts that, that you want to share? Anything come to mind? I have a quick uh, add on just to the Dao conversation and then can the idea of Pablo and his role in Moon Dao and any Dao, like who the leaders are and stuff has been something that we've been able to observe in the like meta story behind the scenes a little bit. I don't, it probably won't make too much of its way into this particular film at the, on the surface level, but, um, but I find we've, we've had a lot of discussion about it um, on our side because it is very fascinating. A lot of what Pablo has said about how a DAO is thoroughly in progress. It's not like a set format that somebody picks up the manual tool and starts. And so all of these moments are, formative and their learnings. And I'm sure Pablo will have many opportunities in the future to help other DAOs get started based on what he's learned or a lot of these early DAO folks. But um, there are these interesting philosophical questions that have come up on, on the back end around like, like a, what is any sort of company of people anyway? It's sort of like, a, it's the sum of their parts. Like everyone involved makes up the characteristics you know, you, you could get super philosophical, like there's no such, I think from a biological standpoint, there's no such thing as an individual because you're made up of all these bacteria and there's these barriers between what's inside and outside are so connected. So there's, I see parallels with the Tao model where Pablo is a force in it. And I think if he were to leave, it would no longer be the same Tao because it would be a collection of these other, this other formula of the group. And it would be something new or whatever, but like the, the, I don't know, mutability of that is very interesting that it's his personality will be a part of this DAO as long as he's there. And the other people who have since been a part of it and left have changed the personality of the DAO and the, the meaning of it. But I think what's interesting too, in this discussion and probably for this pod in general is that like the DAOs as a model will never like fix problems in and of themselves. They'll always like the people that start the DAOs and the people that, that, guide the community we're learning are so important to whether it's successful or not beyond the like you know decentralized technology aspects of it like those are tools 
but they like it, it really is still like very human and very you know democratic sort of approach to problems that want to be solved or projects that want to happen or whatever it is but it's the same with on the studio Dow side like the, it's been great working with Kenny and Rachel and everybody that they've attracted into their sphere uh, there's this incredible group that's that's been coming together on the studio Dow side and it's very eclectic and unique and special and things have been in progress in terms of our own like realizations about what's going on with Dow's right now in this point yes I agree I think on the production of ticket to space <laughs> we were talking to with Django about uh, how everything has uh, fallen into a place where you know this massive community with, with you know, uh, Mundao, ourselves, and uh, Studio Dao, we are all, you know, pulling uh, on the same cart. We all want to create a, a magnific magnificent movie. And going back to the issue of how, you know, Daos are organic and how Mundao uh, is still evolving, I, I think that this only makes the, the film better because no one wants to watch a film where the main character, let's say, is a football player that he always played good football, he played good football in high school, he played good football in college, and now he wins the Super Bowl. That's a boring film. We want to see a story where you have struggle and people, you know, strive to become better. And imagine if everything went uh, uh, good. It's pointless, it's boring. So for us, we are actually really excited about all these complications and all the challenges. And um, we picture a movie where we will have action because we will have the, the rocket scenes, we will have drama, we will have uh, a lot of emotions in, in the screen, a lot of uh, senses of hope and of accomplishment. And I think that in the end it will be a movie that w once you leave the theater, you will feel like you can do something to change your own life and to, to, to work with other people in, in, the, in the pursuit of a really global scale projects. So this is our objective, to inspire people to, you know, to get on with their lives and to find solutions in this new world that, that we are coming into where people like Pablo and these other 11,000 people can join in a Discord chat and you know, pour their ideas and accomplish incredible things. Yeah, I mean, he hearing you talk about it, one of the things that strikes me is that so many not so many, but many aspects of the movie are only going to happen once. Like there will be only one time that this launch, you know, happens that, that Yan like comes off this rocket and goes on the rocket. And like, I, I, I wonder if you feel the burden of, of that, uh, you know, as the director and producer uh, behind this. I, I mean, that must be so stressful thinking about that one shot of, you know, Yan coming up this off this rocket after this, you know, flight. Um, I wonder, I mean, it's both a burden, but also, you know, an incredible gift to be, you know, privy to that. But I, I wonder if that has occurred to you. On my personal experience, I've always been a big uh, space nerd. And, and the fact that I'm here now feels like everything that I've done in my life has got me to this place. Even though it is a huge responsibility, we feel it and, and we picture it as a, as a gift, truly, to be there and to see Pablo and Jan hugging once he goes down from the pod. I mean, it's, it's going to be something that uh, not too many people in this planet uh, can witness. And this is why I'm so thankful uh, with cinema and with documentary filmmaking, because it allowed me to go into these really random and bizarre places and meet all these incredible people that an office job would probably uh, never uh, have given me. So in this sense, we are uh, excited more than anything else, I would say. Part of our job as a producer is to make it happen. There's, where there's a will, there's a way. We're, get, we're gonna make something amazing happen. We're gonna be there for the moments that count. Um, not every, moment works out the way you we expect there's there's always you know things that happen that are completely outside of expectation so that's part of the exciting part about filmmaking the the story evolves as you as you work on it absolutely yeah it's funny hearing 
Matthew and Fernando talk about this and you it's like it's like the same challenges of like shooting a wedding but instead we're like uniting like not just like a couple but like a whole worldwide community over like a common goal so it's really exciting to see how everything will come together I'm wondering if Kenny and Rachel and even Pablo have any closing thoughts if there's anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to mention about what this what this means for you I was just going to say that um, we have to pay for this film. And one of the ways that we're paying for this film is when people come to our juice box and support the film by buying the NFTs. And so I'm not usually a shiller, but I'm going to shill my little heart out right here, which is if you think this is a great story and you want to be a part of it and you want to go on the adventure that Fernando and Susie and Pablo are about to go on to, if you buy this NFT, you will have a ringside seat and be a part of actually documenting this in the right way. So, um, so support us and buy that ticket. Anything you'd like to add, Pablo? I just want to say that, yeah, this is like a, a, a dream team, in my opinion, in terms of like people and like the, the quality of like the directing and producing team and and all of the people that I've interacted with at Studio Dao, it's just like, I'm, I'm super excited to make this happen. And um, yeah, I, I really hope that we can, you know, just tell this story in, in the best way possible and bring everyone along for the ride. Um, yeah, I guess um, an analogy in general, I feel like with, with Dao's is that it's not so much like a, a theater production where it's like, hey, this is like the people that are, that are, you know, making the production happen and the, here's the audience, you know, and there's that like separation. I feel like, um, is it, I think it's the first like long, like like feature film about DAOs, like it, it, it would be, right? And like, that's huge, that's really big. And it's like an opportunity to, to like, you're, you're not just an audience member, like it's happening in real time and you have access to, the, the directors and the producers and like there's like a relationship there um, which is very unique that's like also very new um, so I think that yeah it's like it's cool to be a part of this and uh, I, I hope we can make it all happen <laughs> like I yeah I, I don't want to show it too hard either but you know I think it's uh, yeah it, this is a, a story worth telling and um, yeah really excited to see where, where it all goes. All right. Well, thanks so much to each and every one of you for taking the time to sit down with us and talk about the very beginnings of this Ticket to Space documentary. We can't wait to see the trailer. You know, it's, it's going to be out of this world, you know, um, and we're looking forward to seeing how the story unfolds. Thank you very much for having us. And um, we're really excited about it. We are... Um, receiving all the all the guys and girls and around the world that want to join us in this massive project uh, please join our discord join studio dao you will find us there we are very open about this project we love uh, hearing new ideas and uh, yeah join us and uh, get on the rocket with us yeah thank you very much and i don't i don't know that we emphasize enough how incredible Moondow's goals are they're just completely absurd and entertaining in and of itself and it's that's what makes this like 10x exciting and fun is that they are making things happen so kudos to Moondow and we're so excited to to get started on the story let's get a little bit on the contest right because there's actually going to be an interesting contest that we should just refer to in this thing absolutely yeah um, so one of the things that we're going to be doing is having a send your art into outer space contest. Um, so for some of the upper tiers, people are going to be able to receive a piece of artwork on a patch or a sticker that has actually gone to space with Jan. And those are going to be community sourced pieces of artwork that um, come from the members of MoonDAO or Studio DAO. Um, at the winner's prizes will be sent up into space and distributed, and uh, some of them might even end up on the moon. So please watch for details of that, and we'd love to have your art submissions 
from the various DAOs and other people. If you wanna, if you wanna play, please come join the DAOs. We'd love to have you. So that's the message. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a, a great panel. Uh, Fernando, Susie, Pablo, Kenny, and Rachel. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been really fun. And this uh, will be the first part. Uh, there, there'll be other parts too. So <laughs> stay tuned for, for more as we uh, yeah tell more of this story as it unfolds. So thanks again. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thanks so much. The juice must flow. All right. Mm-hmm.